We will start with Bjorn Schumacher then instead from uh, Cologne. Whenever you're ready. You're very good. Okay. Yeah, my buddy. That's great. Jan, should I give your talk or I give my talk now? <laughs> All right. So, okay. So then um, I'm going to start the session. And I don't know who is now I'm on. Okay, very good. All right. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, genome maintenance mechanisms in, uh, in aging and disease. So let me uh, thank uh, Morten, Daniela, and Alex for putting together a meeting that really is streamed to a worldwide audience because really aging is a worldwide issue of modern societies that all around the globe undergoing the demographic change. And of course, with aging comes the various, come the various chronic diseases of aging. Multimorbidity is really the challenge of the future of the aging society. And so the traditional approach of aging research, of, of uh, um, addressing distinct di disorders that appear uh, in aging are really specialized disciplines. And I think this field really that we are in has broken this pattern by recognizing that all these distinct disorders of aging um, have one common root cause. And so instead of treating disorders like cancer, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, once they have occurred, our field really have, has, um, has, has driven this to the, the point where we now um, could uh, target the aging process by really identifying preventive treatments uh, that could prevent the occurrence and uh, lower the risk for the development of these distinct diseases of aging. And this, of course, requires that we really understand the mechanisms of aging. And I think this can be not emphasized enough that we really need to have the mechanistic, fundamental, basic uh, research on aging to understand the mechanisms um, in order to really uh, have effective treatments for healthy aging. And when we want to understand any um, uh, any biological phenomenon, it's of course essential that we um, consider it in the context of the evolutionary history that has formed uh, a biological process. And here, um, I already mentioned this name during this meeting, um, August Weismann, a zoologist, one of the top three evolutionary biologists of his time after Darwin and Wallace, um, who, uh, whose claim to fame was really to, um, to, to gain a key insight on inheritance, of mechanisms of inheritance, which back then was really not so trivial. Um, there were many competing ideas and uh, he really realized that the germ cells, and only the germ cells, transfer genetic information through the generations. And of course, from this, immediately it becomes clear that as the germ cells perpetuate indefinitely the genetic information um, in humans, modern humans, uh, since almost 7,000 generations, um, the immortality of the soma would have no positive contribution to fitness. So that essentially means that as soon as the, the germ cells have transferred the genetic information to the next generation, maintenance of the soma is no longer required. It has no contribution anymore to fitness. So the soma only needs to maintain for us, uh, to function as a vehicle for the germ cells. Um, but after that, it can decay, age, and die. And so based on these uh, concepts, Tom Kirkwood um, uh, proposed the disposable soma theory of aging, which very simply um, poses that the soma needs to be maintained to allow successful reproduction upon which it can be disposed of. And based on this, there are three questions arising that are really at the heart of our interest um, in the lab. And I will give you uh, two brief examples for the first one and discuss the third one a little bit more in detail. So. Um, the key questions on this background are, is how is somatic ma uh, maintenance adapted to requirements of the germline? If you imagine like some of these disorders that Jan Huymarkus was presenting, where um, a human ages within one decade, there's of course no reproduction, there's no, uh, there would be an extinction of such a species. 
Um, so there need to be some coordination. How do actually germ cells manage to be immortal? Somehow they need to rejuvenate in every single generation completely. Um, the age of an, of an, an fertilized oocyte is, uh, is all of the sudden um, uh, zero years of age. Something must happen in germ cells. Um, and thirdly, which are these processes that uh, determine the somatic maintenance and control aging? One key aspect here is, is the DNA. The DNA is special and distinct from any other molecule in the cell because it's irreplaceable. It contains all the information for building anything. But, which came a little bit as a surprise, um, is how unstable DNA actually is. Our DNA in every genome and every cell in our body is exposed to tens of thousands of lesions on every single day. And these lesions can, uh, can be exogenously induced, UV radiation, for example, but even the normal endogenous metabolism inflicts DNA damage. Even DNA in an aqueous phase undergoes spontaneous deamination. So DNA damage invariably occurs. Um, and it has consequences. The consequence that's most well understood is that it can change the genetic information. It can uh, result in aneuploidy, translocations, mutations, deletions, altering the genetic information. And we know for a very long time that this is a causal event in cancer development. DNA damage causes cancer. But DNA damage can also obstruct. It can block transcription, block translation, uh, uh, block, uh, uh, block replication, sorry. Um, and this has a plethora of consequences. It can alter cell fate. Um, for example, cells may die, they undergo senescence, stem cells uh, are lost, um, and it can lead to functional decline, tissue atrophy, chronic inflammation, all these hallmarks of aging. And in fact, really, DNA damage has uh, uh, recently been linked mechanistically to all these aspects that define hallmarks of the aging process. Of course, it drives genome instability, um, dysfunctional uh, telomeres, telomere shortening leads to genome instability itself as a specialized type of DNA damage. The epigenetic code can be altered um, uh, by DNA damage, by repair processes. I will give you an example of that. Uh, there's also proteostatic stress that actually results from DNA damage when, for example, mutations change protein folding or uh, certain DNA damage responses can actually um, uh, result in protein folding stress. Also, mitochondrial dysfunction has been observed under conditions of DNA damage. There are consequences on the cells, stem cell exhaustion, for example, as a result of apoptosis, cellular senescence, is an outcome of the DNA damage response. There are alterations on signaling mechanisms, very prominently um, insulin-like signaling. I will show you a bit of that. There's a chronic inflammation that is driven by DNA damage, and nutrient sensing pathways can be deregulated. What are the consequences when DNA cannot be repaired? And uh, here are two extreme examples um, of consequences of DNA repair defects in humans. And they, they look completely different, these patients. But both have mechanistically quite linked defects in DNA repair processes. So on the one side here, you see xeroderma pigmentosum patients, and you see very obviously in this child already multiple skin cancers which is something you never see in children normally, because skin cancer takes decades to, to evolve um, from the first moment that uh, UV light damaged the DNA in the skin. And on the other side, you have a cocaine syndrome patient uh, where you see premature aging, no cancer at all, actually, but overt signs of premature aging, huge growth delay, uh, and then premature aging. The mechanistic basis of that has been explored um, since uh, beginning with uh, the first cloning of uh, DNA repair genes in humans in the 1980s uh, through the development of many mouse models um, and a plethora of mechanistic studies that here in this case there's a defect in nucleotide excision repair, one of the most complex types of DNA repair systems. And what is happening here is that there are two distinct mechanisms that really illustrate how these distinct consequences of DNA damage occur. On the one side, you have this global genome 
uh, repair mechanisms that um, scans the entire uh, genome for lesions and defects here lead to an increase in mutagenesis and uh, lead to um, uh, skin cancer susceptibility. On the other side, um, uh, uh, specialized repair mechanisms that recognizes the same lesions when RNA polymerase stalls and here the cocaine syndrome um, uh, uh, proteins then uh, attract the very same repair pathway um, to remove the lesions. But here, these def repair defects that affect transcription are not mutagenic, but instead they're obstructive, they lead to dysfunction and to premature aging. Now these human patients are extremely complex, so are the mouse models, and so we figured we should actually develop a very simple animal model that has really in the aging field given us so much insight about mechanisms of aging that we find highly conserved in humans. And indeed, when we, um, when we engineer the very same genetic defects that these patients have, in, these anim in this very simple metazone system of C. elegans, we find the exact same outcomes. So defects in global genome NER, they lead to genome instability in these worms, particularly in proliferating cells, just like in humans. And you see overt signs in germ stem cells, for example, where there are cro uh, uh, chromosomal bridges, there are double certain break formation. So overt signs of genome instability, of course, a worm doesn't get a cancer like, like, like we uh, as humans get, they're not as complex, but this is a fundamental causal event in cancer development in humans. Transcription coupled repair defects have a completely distinct outcome. Here the worms, when we uh, give them uh, UV uh, irradiation, they arrest their development. Development growth delay is the first phenotype why uh, such a patient sees a pediatrician. And when we do the same thing in, in uh, adult animals, they age prematurely and lose their tissue dysfunction. So we can use now this model to explore, come back to our three questions and find some, find answers to this very fundamental questions. And for the first ones, as I told you, we'll give you just a very, uh, a, a, very broad impression of how we have tackled some of those issues, some examples, and then go to the third issue. So the first one is actually work that was done by Maria Amuleva, um, who presented her um, very exciting uh, current work uh, at this meeting already. And uh, when she was with us, she actually asked the question, can she um, uh, are there responses to the soma when the germ cells are impaired through DNA damage? And uh, in a nutshell, what she identified uh, was a phenomenon that when germ cells, so this is a schematic of the worm, uh, where you see here one arm of the germ line, um, and when we um, uh, uh, introduce DNA damage, even meiotic double strand breaks are sufficient to do that, there's an innate immune response that becomes systemic in these animals. Um, it triggers the activation of the ubiquitin proteasome that through enhanced proteostasis um, uh, then uh, confers systemic stress resistance to the entire animal, and the animal then is able to, um, uh, to, to extend its reproductive lifespan two times of, of its life when the damage in the germ cells is repaired. So there's an interaction between the germ cells and uh, the soma. And there's evidence that this is also true actually in humans. Here's one example of a, of a study of eunuchs in Korea where actually uh, there, there were a lot of historic data on these, on these men and you could compare their, their lifespan that they actually lived with um, socially equal uh, men from, arist from different aristocratic families and you see there's a, a, about a nearly a 20 year lifespan extension. Um, so what's important if you want to uh, you know, consider what are the therapeutic implications here, uh, it's probably the knowledge from even the worms that it's about signaling mechanisms. It has absolutely nothing to do with fertility. It is signaling mechanisms between the germline and the soma. And these are very important to explore. I'll give you one example for the second question. Um, how, do, how are germ cells immortal? What is specific about them? How they maintain their genomes? Because their genomes are indefinitely perpetuated. And so we address this in, in, in uh, C. elegans because it has the simplest possible model for a primordial 
um, a germ cell system, and here Huiling Wu did the work where she actually looked at these two primordial germ cells that will make all germ cells of the animal, uh, and they are flanked by two somatic cells that make uh, the niche for them. When we now treat these animals with UV, we see that in a, in a defect, in a repair defect, they permanently arrest. Um, and when the worms grow up, they actually lack a germline because um, their DNA damage in the primordial germ cells are not, uh, is not fixed. However, this, doesn't, uh, this depends actually on the P53 response, there's a highly conserved P53 response mechanism, and this we characterized actually in this primordial germ cell, that when this primordial germ cell experiences DNA damage, this the elegance P53 signaling is activated, but what was really surprising is that this is not a germ cell autonomous response, but we are an FGF-like signaling. This is called Agle 17, Agle 15 in worms. It's FGF signaling. Um, activates a, um, a, a, a translation um, inducer in a translation activator, a very specific one that amplifies the FGF signal and then really exerts a signal that regulates the DNA damage response in the germ cell. So it's a somatic control of the germ, uh, uh, germline DNA damage response. And we found that this is highly conserved in mammals where niche cells control through the very same proteins the P53 response in, um, uh, in stem cells. Um, and this is something that we are developing uh, uh, very much further because this suggests that this idea of Weismann that uh, germ cells are completely autonomous in, in controlling uh, the genetic inheritance is actually not, is, needs to actually be modified because uh, there are so, somatic control mechanisms of the genome, uh, of the heritable genomes. Now I come to this point where we want to uh, identify the somatic maintenance processes that ultimately will control aging. And I give you here one example. Um, I think the, the most well-known longevity factor, the FOXO transcription factor DAF16, um, that is a central mediator of longevity in C. elegans and probably also in humans. Um, and this actually responds to DNA damage. So normally, uh, when we GFP tag it, it's distributed in the entire cytoplasm, it's inactive, but upon um, UV-induced DNA damage that we use here, there's nuclear localization and activation, and we actually uh, characterize the entire program of what DAF16 is transcriptionally regulating here. As we use a very simple animal model here, we can actually um, ask some very comprehensive questions. So here, for example, we used a proteome and phosphoproteome approach to now explore what, is the, what are these response mechanisms um, to DNA damage. And uh, we're looking here in red and induced proteins, blue repressed proteins, um, and whether they are uh, changed on the phosphor level or on their protein abundance. And in a nutshell, what we find here, and, these, these, um, and here shown are all these interactions, we find very central signaling mechanisms that are actually centrally involved in regulating longevity. So at the very center is the insulin-like signaling pathway that is affected, um, and also the TOR pathway, response to DNA damage. And then there are now processes that are linked to that that are the very much the, the hallmark of aging processes. We find here, for example, a dampening of proteostatic mechanisms um, while autophagy is induced, um, suggesting perhaps that there is a compensatory role here. There's a dampening of metabolic processes, fatty acid metabolism, for example. find also that glucose metabolism is dampened. And on the other side, an induction of chromatin remodeling, and I will come to that in more detail. I want to show you an example of how powerful these longevity assurance pathways are. So here's an example of the DAF2 or H1 mutants. These are mutants that have constitutive um, dampening of insulin-like signaling leading to a constitutive DAF16 activation. Now they have no impact on the removal of DNA damage. Here we look at the two um, cyclobutan pyrimidine dimers, 6 4 photoproducts that are induced here with an antibody the slot blot that are induced after UV, and they are readily removed in the wild-type animals. When we have a completely nucleotide excision repair defective animal, there's no removal. 
And uh, of course, a DAF2 mutant cannot change that because there's no repair. Nonetheless, when we look here at tissue functionality, this is in adult animals where we use for ringer pumping, motility. After this UV treatment, where at these low doses we see no effect on wild type, but repair defect at this very extraordinary low dose, we see already a significant reduction of this functionality. This is completely prevented by the DAF2 mutation, indicating that uh, functionality is maintained despite DNA damage. And indeed, this happens also with the, with the survival of the animals. DAF2 can still greatly extend the lifespan of this repair mutant after damage despite no repair activity. And this uh, led us to suggest that there are really two strategies of longevity. Uh, the one um, are DNA repair mechanisms. DNA repair mechanisms are absolutely essential to let us um, uh, uh, age as slowly as we age, because if we have any defect in a key DNA repair gene, our aging can be accelerated to the very first decade of our life. So when you think about that during, during aging, over our lifespan, there's gradually increasing levels of DNA damage, repair mechanisms delay this. But longevity assurance mechanisms like insulin-like signaling, DAF16, FOXO activation, do something profoundly different. They actually respond to DNA damage, but what they do is they raise the threshold when the DNA damage becomes detrimental for tissue functionality. And uh, the DAF16 gene expression response is one example of that. Um, so two different strategies. Now I want to show you an example um, of how the gen epigenetic alterations are actually affected by the DNA damage response. And this is work um, uh, by a very talented postdoc, uh, Xiao Wang, together with an extraordinary bioinformatician, uh, David Meyer. And what they were interested in is to understand um, how DNA the DNA damage response affects the chromatin structure. And so uh, Yao did a, did a, a, a large-scale screen through all protein re uh, chromatin remodeling factors and found something profoundly interesting about a, a, a complex that's called the MLL compass complex that modifies the um, histone 3 lysine 4. And what she found here, so here we're looking at the sensitivity to UV by developmental growth, where uh, we assess whether after UV, um, the animals that were treated at the earliest larval stage L1 have uh, pursued through L2, L3, L4 larval stages. And what you can appreciate here that when we compare to the wild type where about 50% of the animals are arrested, um, that here a set of mutants that are all components of these um, of this MLA compass complex, uh, regulating this complex, they are hypersensitive, while the, the mutation in the demethylase has the opposite phenotype where they become resistant. So it became clear from the combination of mutants that we used here that are all regulatory components that the really critical deposition is the dimethylation of H H3K4. And so we zoomed in on that. Um, and here we also, we don't only see this developmental growth effect, but also when we trigger uh, uh, aging here by DNA damage, when the solid lines we see a reduction of the lifespan, and this is exacerbated by these MLL compass regulatory mutants. They are even shorter lived. And the demethylase here, two independent alleles, have the opposite effect. They become greatly resistant and can live longer under the condition of DNA damage. We see a very specific deposition of this uh, specific mark, this dimethylation, that occurs 24 hours after UV treatment. This is actually the time when the damage has been removed. Um, so it's a post-repair um, uh, effect. Uh, unrelated histone modifications are not changed. This is quantified here. Now we ask maybe, uh, how does that affect gene expression? And what we did here was actually to do RNA-seq um, and a, a chip seek of the dimethyl mark, and we see that there's an enrichment of genes that by this time point are induced. And these are interestingly genes that are initially repressed in the presence of UV, but then at, at this post repair um, a point that we are arriving here, here now are actually re expressed. And these genes uh, have the increased deposition of this dimethylation. What are these genes? <laughs> 
These genes are all linked to very specific processes. Um, and the specific processes are all um, uh, linked to um, uh, protein biosynthesis, um, uh, ranging from the spliceosome and mRNA surveillance through translation initiation uh, on a transport ribosome uh, biogenesis and so on. So does it affect actually the bi protein biosynthesis? We used here lysine incorporation, which after which is greatly dampened to just about 30% after UV treatment, six hours, and then over the time recovers here in wild type. And this recovery is completely absent in a, a mutant of this MLA compass complex when this dimethylation cannot be deposited. When it, uh, the, the reverse happens, when there's a demethylase defect, there's an even more readily uh, um, recovery of protein biosynthesis. You see some of the processes, spliceosome, proteasome, uh, ribosome proteins, that are always much more pronouncedly recovering in the demethylase mutant, but here sometimes even completely deteriorate when the dimethylation mark cannot be set. Then we, we tested this by low-dose cyclohexamide treatment. So if we uh, here inhibit protein biosynthesis, it's the most well-known inhibitor of protein biosynthesis, at a dose where there's normally no effect whatsoever, at a low dose, we all of a sudden see that these, the Y-type animals become exquisitely sensitive to UV. There's already the very high sensitivity of the uh, MLA compass mutant. But then the demethylase that is here, mutant that here, is very resistant to UV. All of the sudden becomes very, uh, very UV sensitive, indicating that the recovery of protein biosynthesis is really the critical point of resistance here. We see that also during aging, DNA damage-driven aging, um, where we see here again um, uh, the, the, the Y-type lifespan after in the solid black line here, the hypersensitivity of the MLA compass mutant, the resistant of the SBR5 mutant, the demethylase mutant, and this resistance is completely abrogated by in the presence of cyclohexamide. So what we, what we propose here is that we actually found a link between this, the DNA damage through epigenetic alteration to proteostat proteostatic stress, where um, the DNA damage initially inhibits translation and, and, and uh, transcription um, uh, until it's repaired by transcription coupled repair, um, which is required, data I didn't have time to show you, it's required for the, the MLA compass complex to deposit the dimethylation. And this dimethylation specifically on, on genes that encode uh, for uh, factors that are involved in protein biosynthesis and homeostasis is required for the, uh, for the recovery of the transcription. And, and these processes can then promote um, developmental growth as well as longevity in emit um, DNA damage. So just to summarize what I told you today, um, we are interested in how the organisms respond to DNA damage. Um, both in the soma as well as in the germline. I told you that the somatic maintenance is regulated by responses to germline DNA damage, that the soma, vice versa, regulates the genome stability in the germline, um, that somatic maintenance um, emit the DNA damage is regulated through DAF16-mediated longevity pathways, and the MLA compass, uh, complex deposits this dimethylation, a very specific mark that links DNA repair to proteon homeostasis. And I acknowledged uh, the people who did the work. Um, we currently have a postdoc position available if you're interested, um, and I very much thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bjorn. That was a fantastic uh, talk. Uh, and I really appreciate that you stepped in uh, during this uh, technical issue. Uh, we have time, I think, for one question. Uh, we have a question on Slack that I thought was quite interesting, so I'm good, just going to choose this. Uh, have you also looked into the role of histone acetylation? deacetylation in lifespan maintenance post-DNA damage? Yeah, we've, uh, that were part of our screen. We, we looked at that. Um, in, the, in the screen, we only use development, so uh, this will be now very interesting to actually explore also um, in, the, in the longevity regulation. Right. Yeah, that yes. would be very fascinating. Yes. Thank you so much, Bjorn. Right, great. Really Thank wonderful you. talk.